Chapter 10 of Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic by Thomas Higginson. Chapter 10 King Arthur at Avalon. In the ruined castle at Winchester, England, Built by William the Conqueror, there is a hall called the Great Hall, where Richard Coeur de Lyon was received by his nobles when rescued from captivity, where Henry III was born, where all the Edwards held court, where Henry VIII entertained the Emperor Charles V, where Queen Mary was married to Philip II, where Parliament met for many years. It is now a public hall for the county, and at one end of it, the visitor sees against the wall a vast wooden tablet on which the names of King Arthur's knights of the round table are inscribed in a circle. No one knows its date or origin, though it is known to be more than 400 years old, but there appear upon it the names most familiar to those who have read the legends of King Arthur whether in Tennyson's poems or elsewhere. There are Lancelot and Bedivere, Gawain and Dagonet, Modred and Gareth, and the rest. Many books have been written of their deeds, but a time came when almost all those knights were to fall, according to the legend, in one great battle. Modred, the king's nephew, had been left in charge of the kingdom during Arthur's absence, and had betrayed him and tried to dethrone him, meaning to crown himself king. Many people joined with him, saying that under Arthur they had had only war and fighting, but under Modred they would have peace and bliss. Yet nothing was farther from Modred's purpose than bliss or peace and it was agreed at last that a great battle should be fought for the kingdom. On the night of Trinity Sunday, King Arthur had a dream. He thought he sat in a chair upon a scaffold, and the chair was fastened to a wheel. He was dressed in the richest cloth of gold that could be made, but far beneath him he saw a pit full of black water, in which were all manner of serpents and floating beasts. Then the wheel began to turn, and he went down, down among the floating things, and they wreathed themselves about him till he cried, Help! Help! Then his knights and squires and yeomen aroused him, but he slumbered again, not sleeping nor thoroughly waking. Then he thought he saw his nephew, Sir Gawain, with a number of fair ladies, and when King Arthur saw him, he said, Oh, fair nephew! What are these ladies who come with you? Sir, said Sir Gawain, these are the ladies for whose protection I fought while I was a living man, and God has given them grace that they should bring me thither to you to warn you of your death. If you fight with Sir Mordred tomorrow, you must be slain, and most of your people on both sides. So Sir Gawain and all the ladies vanished, and then the king called upon his knights and squires and yeomen, and summoned his lords and bishops. They agreed to propose to Sir Modred that they should have a month's delay, and meanwhile agreed to meet him with fourteen persons on each side, besides Arthur and Modred. Each of these leaders warned his army when they met to watch the other, and not to draw their swords until they saw a drawn sword on the other side. In that case, they were to come on fiercely. So the small party of chosen men on each side met and drank wine together, and agreed upon a month's delay before fighting. But while this was going on, an adder came out of a bush, and stung a knight on the foot, and he drew his sword to slay it, and thought of nothing farther. At the sight of that sword, the two armies were in motion. Trumpets were blown instantly, and the men of each army thought that the other army had begun the fray. Alas, this unhappy day, cried King Arthur, and as the old chronicle says, 
nothing there was but rushing and riding, fencing and striking, and many a grim word was there spoken either to other, and many a deadly stroke. The following is the oldest account of the battle, translated into quaint and literal English by Madden, from the book called Leoman's Brute. Innumerable folk it came toward the host, riding and on foot, as the rain down falleth, Arthur marched to Cornwall with an immense army. Mordred heard that and advanced against him with innumerable folk. There were many fated. Upon the tambour they came together. The place hight Camelford evermore lasted the same word. And at Camelford was assembled sixty thousand and more thousands thereto. Mordred was their chief. Then thitherward gan ride Arthur the mighty with innumerable folk, fated though it were, upon the tambour they encountered together, elevated their standards, advanced together, drew their long swords, smote on the helms, fire outsprang, spears splintered, shields gan shiver, shafts break in pieces. There fought altogether innumerable folk, Tambor was in flood with blood to excess. There might no man in the fight know any warrior, nor who did worse, nor who better. So was the conflict mingled, for each slew downright, were he swain, were he knight. There was Modred slain, and deprived of life day, and all his knights slain in the fight. There were slain all the brave Arthur's warriors, high and low, and all the Britons of Arthur's board, and all his dependents of many kingdoms, and Arthur wounded with broad slaughter spear, fifteen dreadful wounds he had, in the least one might thrust two gloves. Then was there no more remained in the fight, of two hundred thousand men that there lay hewed in pieces, except Arthur the king alone, and two of his knights. Arthur was wounded wondrously much. There came to him a lad who was of his kindred. He was Cador's son, the Earl of Cornwall, Constantine the lad hight. He was dear to the king. Arthur looked on him where he lay on the ground and said these words with sorrowful heart. Constantine, thou art welcome. Thou wert Cador's son. I give thee here my kingdom, and defend thou my Britons ever in thy life, and maintain them all the laws that have stood in my days, and all the good laws that in Uther's days stood. And I will fare to Avalon, to the fairest of all maidens, to Argant the queen, an elf most fair, and she shall make my wounds all sound, make me all whole, with healing droughts, and afterwards I will come to my kingdom, and dwell with the Britons with mickle joy. Even with the words there approached from the sea, that was a short boat, floating with the waves, and two women therein, wondrously formed, and they took Arthur Anon, and bare him quickly, and laid him softly down, and forth they gan depart. Then it was accomplished that Merlin, Wilom said that mickle care should be of Arthur's departure. The Britons believe yet that he is alive and dwelleth in Avalon with the fairest of all elves, and the Britons ever yet expect when Arthur shall return. Was never the man born of any lady chosen that knoweth of the sooth to say more of Arthur, but Wilom was a sage hight Merlin, he said with words, his sayings were sooth, that an Arthur should yet come to help the English. Another traditional account which Tennyson has mainly followed in a poem is this. The king bade Sir Bedivere take his good sword Excalibur and go with it to the waterside and throw it into the water and return to tell what he saw. Then Sir Bedivere took the sword, and it was so richly and preciously adorned 
that he would not throw it and came back without it. When the king asked what had happened, Sir Bedivere said, I saw nothing but waves and wind. And when Arthur did not believe him and send him again, he made the same answer. And then, when sent a third time, he threw the sword into the water as far as he could. Then an arm and a hand rose above the water and caught it, and shook and brandished it three times and vanished. Then Sir Bedivere came back to the king. He told what he had seen. Alas, said Arthur, help me from hence, for I fear I have tarried over long. Then Sir Bedivere took King Arthur upon his back and went with him to the water's side. And when they had reached there, a barge with many fair ladies was lying there, with many ladies in it, and among them three queens, and they all had black hoods, and they wept and shrieked when they saw King Arthur. Now put me in the barge, said Arthur, and the three queens received him with great tenderness, and King Arthur laid his head in the lap of one, and she said, Ah, dear brother, why have ye tarried so long until your wound was cold? And then they rode away, and King Arthur said to Sir Bedivere, I will go unto the valley of Avalon to heal my grievous wound, and if I never return, pray for my soul. He was rowed away by the weeping queens, and one of them was Arthur's sister Morgan Le Fay. Another was the queen of North Gallus, and the third was the queen of Wastelands. And it was the belief for years in many parts of England that Arthur was not dead, but would come again to reign in England when he had been nursed long enough by Morgan Le Fay in the island of Avalon. The tradition was that King Arthur lived upon this island in an enchanted castle, which had the power of a magnet so that every one who came near it was drawn thither and could not get away. Morgan Le Fay was its ruler, called more correctly Morgan La Fee, or the fairy, and her name Morgan meant seaborn. By one tradition, the queens who bore away Arthur were accompanied in the boat by the bard and enchanter Merlin, who had long been the king's adviser, and this is the description of the island said to have been given by Merlin to another bard, Taliesin. We came to that green and fertile island which each year is blessed with two autumns, two springs, two summers, two gatherings of fruit, the land where pearls are found, where the flowers spring as you gather them, that isle of orchids called the Isle of the Blessed. No tillage there, no coulter to tear the bosom of the earth. Without labor it affords wheat and the grape. There the lives extend beyond a century. There nine sisters, whose will is the only law, rule over those who go from us to them. The eldest excels in the art of healing and exceeds her sisters in beauty. She is called Morgana, and knows the virtues of all the herbs of the meadow. She can change her form and soar in the air like a bird. She can be where she pleases in a moment, and in a moment descend on our coasts from the clouds. Her sister Thetan is renowned for her skill on the harp. With the prince we arrived, and Morgana received us with fitting honor, and in her own chamber she placed the king on a bed of gold, and with delicate touch she uncovered the wound. Long she considered it, and at length said to him that she could heal it if he stayed long with her, and willed her to attempt her cure. Rejoiced at this news, we entrusted the king to her care, and soon after set sail. Sir Thomas Mallory, who wrote the book called The History of King Arthur, or more commonly The Mort de Arthur, utters these high thoughts concerning the memory of the great king. O ye mighty and pompous lords, shining in the glory transitory of this unstable life, as in reigning over great realms and mighty great countries, fortified with strong castles 
and towers, edified with many a rich city, ye also, ye fierce and mighty knights, so valiant in adventurous deeds of arms, behold, behold, see how this mighty conqueror, King Arthur, whom in his humane life all the world doubted, see also the noble Queen Guinevere, which sometime sat in her chair, adorned with gold, pearls, and precious stones, now lie full low in obscure fosse or pit, covered with clods of earth and clay. Behold also this mighty champion, Sir Lancelot, peerless of all knighthood. See now how he lieth groveling upon the cold mould, now being so feeble and faint, that sometime was so terrible. How and in what manner ought ye to be so desirous of worldly honor so dangerous? Therefore methinketh this present book is right necessary often to be read, for in it shall ye find the most gracious, knightly, and virtuous war of the most noble knights of the world, whereby they gat praising continuously also me seemeth by the oft reading thereof, ye shall greatly desire to accustom yourself in following of those gracious knightly deeds, that is to say, to dread God and to love righteousness, faithfully and courageously to serve your sovereign prince, and the more that God hath given you the triumphal honor, the meeker ye ought to be, ever fearing the unstableness of this deceitful world. End of chapter 10